Well, that would give us an opportunity to further uh, debate and discuss uh, the Menendez proposal, which we just invoked cloture on yesterday uh, for the balance of the week. And so I uh, Mr. President. Uh, the leader. Reserving the right to object. <clears throat> Mr. President, I, I think most people know I worked here as a police officer for most of the time I was going to law school. But I also worked for a period of time in the post office. Now, I'm not an expert at the post office, but I know the importance of post offices. And I know what's going to happen in the state of Nevada if we don't make some arrangement to help the Postal Service survive. Scores of small post offices in Nevada will go out of business. There will be uh, distribution centers that may not exist after a few months. So I want to get to the postal bill as much as anyone in this chamber, having worked for the Postal Service through the House Post Office. Um, so I, I, wanted, I want to move to the postal bill. But I'm not going to be um, forced into doing it at a time that may not work out just right for our schedule, that is uh, the Senate. So I will move to that shortly after the recess, just as quickly as I can, but I'm not going to agree to a specific time. So I object. For the, I, I object to the modification. And I, the request for the initial, the request for the initial modification is objected to. And I object to the uh, initial request. Objection is heard for the initial request. Okay. The clerk, the clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions Andrew. of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the motion to proceed to calendar number 296, S. 1789, the 21st Century Postal Service Act, signed by 16 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the motion to proceed to S-1789, a bill to improve, sustain, and transform the United States Postal Service, shall be brought to a close? The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Begich. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bingaman. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement,
Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken. Aye. <laughs> Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Inouye, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Soon. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker,
Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blumenthal, Boxer, Brown of Massachusetts, Brown of Ohio, Collins, Conrad, Coons, Feinstein, Franken, Hagen, Klobuchar, Cole, Levin, Lieberman, McCaskill, Menendez, Murray, Nelson of Florida, Reed of Nevada, Sanders, Stabenow, Tester, Udall of Colorado, Warner, Webb, and White House. Senators voting in the negative. Alexander, Ayotte, Barrasso, Blunt, Burr, Chambliss, Coates, Cornyn, Graham, Heller, Inhofe, Isaacson, Johnson of Wisconsin, Kyle, Lee, McCain, McConnell, Mikulski, Roberts, Rockefeller, Toomey, and Vitter. Mr. Corker. Mr. Corker, no. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Luger. Mr. Luger, no. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Grassley? Mr. Grassley? No. Mr. Bingaman? Mr. Bingaman? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Mr. Bennett? Aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye. Mr. DeMint, Mr. DeMint, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, uh, hey, did you take that back? Yeah. aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, no.
Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden? Aye. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin? Aye. Mr. Johans, Mr. Johans? No. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul? No. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby? No. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, no. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, ah. Uh, Mrs. Hutchison, Mrs. Hutchison, no. Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, no. Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, aye. Mr. Inoue, Mr. Inoue, Aye. Mr. Baggage, Mr. Baggage. Aye. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi. No. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, no. Mr. Rish, Mr. Rish, no. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baucus, no. Mr. Pryor, Mr. Pryor, aye.
Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker. No. Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Akaka, aye. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, no. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, no, Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye.
Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Nevada? No. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or wishing to change their vote? Hearing none on this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 46, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn not having voted in the affirmative. The motion is not agreed to. President. The majority leader. I enter a motion to reconsider vote by which cloture was not invoked on the motion to proceed to calendar number 296, S. 1789. The motion is entered. Would the chair be kind enough to announce the pending business? 
S2204 is the pending business, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 337, S2204, bill to eliminate unnecessary tax subsidies and promote renewable energy and energy conservation. I have an amendment to the desk. The clerk will report. The senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, proposes an amendment number 1968. He's on that amendment. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The yeas and nays are ordered. I have a second degree amendment that has also been filed at the desk. The clerk will report. The senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, proposes an amendment number 1969 to amendment number 1968. I have a motion to commit the bill with instruction, which is at the desk. The clerk will report the motion. The senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, moves to commit the bill to the Committee on Finance with instructions to report back forthwith with an amendment number 1970. I ask the yeas and nays on that motion. Is there a sufficient second? The yeas and nays are ordered. I have an amendment to the instructions at the desk. The clerk will report. The senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, proposes an amendment number 1971 <clears throat> to the instructions of the motion to commit S-2204 to the Committee on Finance. Ask the yeas and nays on that amendment. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The yeas and nays are ordered. I have a second degree amendment at the desk. The clerk will report. The senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, proposes an amendment number 1972 to amendment number 1971. I have a cloture motion at the desk. The clerk will report. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on S-2204, a bill to eliminate unnecessary tax subsidies and promote renewable energy and energy conservation, signed by 16 senators, as follows. Read of Nevada. I consent that the names not be read. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the mandatory karma rule 22 be waived. Without objection. Mr. President, I now move to proceed to calendar 339, the Paying a Fair Share Act, which is asked 2230. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 339 as 2230, a bill to reduce the deficit by imposing a minimum effective tax rate for high income taxpayers. Madam Chair, I note the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akanka. Madam President. The Senator from Delaware. I ask unanimous consent that proceedings under the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today to address a simple but important issue about what our path forward is to building a stronger and safer America. I was deeply frustrated to hear earlier today that the transportation bill, which was passed by an overwhelming bipartisan consensus in this chamber, has gone over to the House, and they cannot find a way forward to respond to this bill from us or find any clarity or certainty about whether to simply take up, debate, amend, or consider and enact, hopefully, our bill from the Senate, or ask for short-term extensions of 30, 60, or 90 days. Madam President, as you know as a former governor, and as I know as a former county executive, when investing in things as important as bridges and highways, roads that make infrastructure, transportation, and a reliable, predictable future for our economy possible, nothing is more important than certainty. Financing major highway projects, buying major pieces of equipment, hiring the crews to do the work is exactly the sort of thing where certainty is critical. And so I have a simple question to our friends in the other chamber, which is when they will take up this bill that passed this chamber by such an overwhelming margin, and when they will take seriously the broad bipartisan input from every imaginable group in support of this. I was active in my previous elected role as county executive with the National Association of Counties, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the AFL-CIO have all weighed in. In fact, if I remember correctly, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wrote every single office 
in the Senate in support of this legislation calling for specific action, specific action that both the Congress and the administration can take right now to support job growth and economic productivity without adding to the deficit. This bill came out of the committee after remarkable work by Senator Boxer of California and Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma, two senators who are widely viewed as being at the opposite ends of our political spectrum here in this chamber. And Madam President, when I go home to Delaware, I hear folks say over and again, why can't you work together? Why can't you iron out your differences and put America on a clearer, straighter track towards stronger recovery? Well, this is exactly the sort of bill that will accomplish that end. A two-year reauthorization, a $109 billion bill that in my small state of Delaware would create 6,700 jobs, now hangs in the balance. It will expire at the end of this month. And rather than take up and consider and hopefully pass this bill, folks in the other chamber, and frankly, sadly, largely folks on the other side of the partisan aisle here, are refusing to do so. And will instead take a short-term chip shot of an extension. I simply wanted to say, if I might, Madam President, that certainty is something I respect from my years in the private sector. Certainty is something I hear from the other side of the aisle in the other chamber all the time. And this is a moment when certainty can be served by the House taking up and passing the Senate pass bill. Will my friend from Delaware uh, yield for a question? Absolutely. Madam President, I yield to the Senator from Alaska. Uh, my friend from Delaware, you were a county executive. Uh, I was a mayor of a community. We had to deal with the real life uh, aftermath of what happens around here, especially when it comes to these extensions and what happens. And I know in my city, when, when I saw these extensions from that end of the, you know, the, the table, we always had to stop projects, slow them down, uh, didn't have the money to finish them, winter shut down. All it did was add cost, increase the capacity or decrease the capacity of roads, and literally take projects off the list. Tell me, in your community, I mean, you, you had to deal with this probably like I had to. Did you have the same kind of impact where you had to tell contractors, I'm sorry, we don't have the money because the federal government hasn't done their job that they said they would do 20 some times before and they never completed it? Is that a similar situation? Madam President, the Senator from Alaska is absolutely right. Uh, in my county, in my county role, we didn't do roads. Our state does the roads, but we did sewers and heavy capital infrastructure like sewers that in our case, in our little county, would cost tens of millions of dollars. We'd be on a project, we'd be off a project. We'd be on a project, we'd be off a project. We were fortunate that our county, in good times, had enough surplus, had enough money in reserve, that we could go ahead and authorize the bond issue and authorize the project. But as the economy turned, and as our balance sheet got tougher, we had to wait. We had to put things on hold. We had to put key projects off. And I know the good senator from Alaska, as a former mayor of Anchorage, also saw that happen in transportation. Is that not the case that certainty here was an enormous challenge when you were relying on a federal partner who was unreliable. Absolutely, and I, and I would say again to the senator uh, from Delaware, I know in Alaska what I chaired the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO, which had this money that would come from this legislation. It would come to us, and if they delayed it here, or they had these crazy continuations because for some reason they couldn't get their work done, and now we're seeing that on the House side, they've had months months to work on this. I think they actually banked that we would not work together here, Democrats and Republicans, and get something done. We actually did. And a pretty significant piece of legislation about transportation infrastructure that's crumbling in this country, 74 votes, bipartisan, from all spectrums of the political persuasion here. And I think they banked that we would fail, but we didn't. Five weeks of work, a lot of compromise, because we know what the impacts are on the, on the street if we don't do this. And I can tell you back home, because if the House doesn't take action on a very reasonable bill, a bipartisan bill, what will happen in Alaska is some of these projects will what they call de-obligate or not obligate the funds, which means they will delay them. That means the contractors who expected to do work this summer will not. And in Alaska, because we're a winter climate, a lot of northern states have a similar situation, the asphalt plant that lays the asphalt down closes usually the first part of October. So you have a window that shrinks very rapidly. And if you're not careful, the net result is you have no projects and you pay more, which means the delay the House side is doing 
is going to cost taxpayers more money. There will be less jobs. In Alaska, we have 18,000 jobs at risk. 18,000 jobs at risk. And at the end of the day, again, you get less product, less roads. So I'm, I can only assume the experience I have here, your state government that works with your county when you were county executive, same thing they had to go through like you explained on your water and sewer projects. But as you said, times are different. You can't supplant local money like it used to be because we don't have it. The economy is struggling and starting to come back, but here we are at a moment. The economy is moving the right direction. What are we doing? The house over there is just waiting. I think that's the example you were looking for that we're doing and what we're suffering through. What strikes me most about this, Madam President, and to the good senator from Alaska, is that of all the sectors of our economy that have suffered since the financial collapse of 2008, all the sectors in the entire American economy, at least in my home state, construction was hit the hardest. We already knew that we were far behind in investment. We've got tens of thousands of bridges that are out of compliance with basic engineering standards. Half of our roads are below the standards we would expect for a modern economy. This is money that can and should be invested in putting people to work in construction which has suffered from the highest unemployment, where it's got support from the Chamber of Commerce to the AFL-CIO, where we wrestled through the tough processes here over several weeks, as the Senator says, and we've got a strongly bipartisan bill over, sitting, ready to go. There's other things that we debate in this chamber that maybe will create jobs, maybe won't. There is no question. Even those who have the strongest concerns about the federal role in our economy can't disagree that federal highway projects put people to work, strengthen our economy, make us more competitive. This bill is ready to go. Why you would not take it up and enact it today, I can't imagine. And to the good senator from Alaska, I might say, you may have a somewhat shorter summer season than we do, but if you've got 18,000 jobs at risk, I can only imagine the kinds of calls you're getting from your home state as I'm getting from my state, urging that the House of Representatives take up this strong and bipartisan bill and pass it so we can all move forward and create some real jobs. Last comment I'll um, say, and I'm sure uh, just more of a question, I'm sure you have the same situation as you just described. Yes, getting those calls, and they're not just, you know, people say, well, this is a union thing. No, it's union, non-union, chamber, environmentalists, neighborhoods, community councils. It's everybody you can imagine because these are real jobs about real people, about real communities. Over there, I think they think it's some theory that, oh, if they delay it, nothing really will happen. They're wrong, because you and I have lived on that other side and had to live with the consequences of inaction. And this is one of those bills you look for where there's bipartisan support. All the groups that are out there from all walks of life support it, and everyday people understand it. When I was back in Anchorage and I'm getting some petroleum and some gas at the gas station, someone come up. And they'd ask me, because why? We're just about to start our season in the bidding process. Because you've got to take 30, 60, 90 days to get the bids out, and then you've got to actually construct. I think they sometimes think over there in the House that it's some fantasy land that whatever they do really has no effect. This does. I think you said it very clearly, and I just really appreciate you allowing me to ask a few questions and more commentary at times here. But it seems the most ridiculous thing with American people, Alaskans, are telling me every day, work together, create a bipartisan legislation, whatever it might be. Here's one we have done successfully, and now we're ready. But over there, they're just playing politics. They've now twi tried twice to do something this week, and they still can't get it moving. So I would encourage them on the other side to just move forward on the bipartisan bill that the Senate has passed when I know they were banking we wouldn't pass it. We did it. We did our work. The American people are waiting and waiting for these jobs. The contractor community is ready. The communities are ready. It's time to move forward. So thank you for allowing me to ask a few questions and give a little commentary. And thank you to the Senator from Alaska. Thank you Madam President. As we both know from our former roles, when you have a short-term extension, there are costs. It means that folks who were getting mobilized, getting organized, getting ready, you have to pull them back. When the state coffers, the county coffers, the municipal coffers don't have the ability to float and put in place for the federal funds that they're waiting for, it means projects get canceled, people lose their jobs, opportunity and optimism that we're moving forward 
get pulled back. We've got folks all over this chamber and the other, former governors, former mayors, former county executives, former business leaders, who know the importance of a strong and reliable federal partnership in strengthening infrastructure in this country. I just want to congratulate again Senator Boxer and Senator Inhofe for working together so well to craft a tough, strong, capable, bipartisan bill, and it is my plea that the members of the other chamber would promptly take it up, consider it, and pass it so we can get America back to work. Thank you, Madam President. With that, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from California. Madam President, before they leave the floor, I really uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Coons and, and Senator Begich and you, Senator Shaheen, Madam President, for your very important words that you gave today. In behalf of the House, taking up and passing the bipartisan Senate transportation bill. And it's interesting to note we also had uh, the senator from Alaska, the senior senator, Senator Murkowski, also speak out in favor of the House picking up and passing the Senate bipartisan bill. I also served in county as a county supervisor a long time ago. But I think we all understand that what we do here makes a difference. You know, this is one nation under God indivisible. You can't have a circumstance where one state puts their funding, their own funding from their state into highways, but the next door state does nothing, and you can't really have commerce. And that's why I thought Dwight Eisenhower, when he was president, Republican president in the 50s, said it well. He was a logistics expert. And he's the one who started the national highway system because he knew from his experience in war that you've got to move goods and people. And he also knew as his role as president that in order to be a strong economy, we had to do the same thing here at home. So for me to see this house dither as they are doing, they are dithering on a bill. All they have to do is take up the bipartisan bill. For goodness sakes, they got three quarters of the Senate to support it. And all we need is 218 votes. And you know, when I served in the House for 10 years, what did I learn? You needed 218. And Tip O'Neill never cared where he got his votes. He just got the votes for the American people. So I have written letters to uh, Congressman uh, Boehner, Speaker Boehner, and Leader Cantor, and I have begged them to please work with us on this bill. And all we get back are statements from their staff, uh, well, we're going to do it our way. And as Congresswoman Pelosi, the Democratic leader, said today, when you say my way or the highway about a highway bill, <laughs> you really don't get much done. I also wanted to thank Senator Klobuchar. She also held office in the state level. And she was a district attorney, and she understands what happens when we work together, federal government, state government, local government, all of us working together for jobs. And that's what this bill is about. So I'm going to call today on the House to immediately take up and pass the bipartisan boxer Inhofe bill. And I'm going to ask them to abandon their goal of a series of extensions. You know, um, Madam President, when you go to buy a house, your constituents and mine, they need a mortgage. Maybe it will be 10-year mortgage, 15, maybe 20, 30-year mortgage. If the banker looked at them and said, well, we can only give you a mortgage for 60 days or 30 days, it would be very difficult, <laughs> to put it mildly. It's disruptive. You don't know how to plan. You don't know what it's going to cost. You don't know if you're going to ever get the money for the House. So the House, by taking up these extensions, they have to understand the impact. And today I called a press conference to let the press know what the impact is of these extensions. The extension means job losses. And we started to put together a list from, that are coming to us from the state of job losses already happening in the field because of the lack of action by the House. North Carolina, I spoke to the Secretary of Transportation there today. He has delayed the remaining 2012 projects totaling $1.2 billion. 
that would employ 41,000 people. So 41,000 people do not have work as we speak today because the House is dithering and not passing the bipartisan Senate transportation bill. I spoke to the officials in Nevada. Thousands of jobs there lost as we speak because the House is considering an extension instead of passing a bill such as our bill. Maryland, I spoke to them, same thing, thousands of jobs. I spoke to Michigan, same thing. And right now we're putting together a list from all across the country of job losses in all of our states as a result of the House failing to take and pass the bipartisan Senate bill. I mean, what more bipartisanship do they need than to have 75 senators support the bill? One of them was absent due to a funeral, so we got 74 votes to 22 against. Okay? What more do they want? Now, anyone watching the Senate today sees how paralyzed we are. We haven't been able to do a thing. There's filibusters on fixing the post office. There's filibusters on making sure that uh, big oil doesn't keep ripping off consumers at the pump. Filibuster, 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 filibuster. But we were able to get over all that and pass a transportation bill. Why wouldn't the House be thrilled about that? Why wouldn't the House embrace what we did? Why would the House instead stand up again today and say, we're going to have a 60-day extension. Guess what? They pulled it, Madam President. They're not having a vote on that today because of the uproar it is creating in the states and on the House floor. The House has not delivered on its promise for a bill. All they do, the leadership, is complain about our bill. Today, I couldn't believe it, Chairman Micah said we don't pay for this. This bill isn't paid for. When Senator Baucus and Senator Thune and others worked across party lines to pay for our bill, it's 100% paid for. And guess what it does? It protects 1.9 million jobs and creates another million. That's what our bill does. So they're pulling this vote. They're pulling this vote today. Good, I'm glad they're pulling this vote because they ought to instead pass the bipartisan Senate transportation bill. I want to tell you a story about what's actually happening out there in the economy. If we do nothing, 1.9 million jobs are gone. 1.9 million jobs on March 31st. If we do an extension, then you have death by a thousand cuts. A proportion of this, these jobs are lost and it keeps getting worse with every extension. So it's the end of these jobs, but slow, torturous end of these jobs. I want to show you, Madam President, how many unemployed construction workers there are? 1.4 million. Why is that? When the unemployment rate is 8.3%, the unemployment rate among construction workers is 17.1%. Why is that? Because we were having a very tough housing crisis and we're not out of it yet. So all of these workers who are building houses now were hoping to be able to build highways, build freeways, fix bridges. And our bill does that. Our bill will take these people and put them to work. We could get this unemployment rate down to 400,000 because we'll take a million off this with the expansion of the TIFIA program, which stands for Transportation infrastructure financing, which upfronts the money for cities and states in your state and mine and others, and gets projects built faster. So I'm going to show you what it would look like if you put every unemployed construction worker into a football stadium. This is a Super Bowl stadium, and it's filled. Imagine each and every one of these seats is filled by an unemployed construction worker and then close your eyes and imagine 13 more stadiums for a total of 14 stadiums. 14 stadiums full of unemployed construction workers. That's what we're facing 
And yet and still, the House will not take up and pass the bipartisan transportation bill. And they're flirting with extensions, which is just the end of these jobs, but slower and more excruciating. Now, we talk about jobs, but we have to talk about businesses. These jobs are private sector jobs, and these businesses, over 11,000 of them, are construction companies who would be adversely impacted. I met with business owners. One man was teary-eyed. He said, Senator, I've had to lay off 1,000 people because of the indecision here, because of the constant extensions we've had on the highway bill. We need your bill now. And I said, I understood. He said, I can't look at another worker. He said, extensions are like living hand to mouth. It just doesn't work. If you know, again, that all you're going to get is 90 days worth of federal funding, how can you let a contract for a year? No one's going to go out and let a contract for 90 days for a big program that lasts for a year, a year and a half of construction. So we just have to remember, we're not just talking about workers, we're talking about the businesses that support those workers. I'm going to show you a series of editorials. They have run in red states. They have run in blue states. They have run in purple states. Madam President, I'm going to make a statement here and I'm going to stand by it. Everyone in America gets this except the House of Representatives. Everyone in America gets this except the Republicans in the House of Representatives. Save a few of them who are courageous. Four of them have broken off. One of them from your home state. Two of them from Illinois. One of them from North Carolina. And they said, you know what? We stand with those who say take up and pass the Senate bipartisan bill. Good for them for showing that kind of courage. And I say to you now, it's a quarter to five in the evening. If any of them are tuning in to this little discussion, listen to what these newspapers are saying. House should pass transportation bill. The number one priority for the House should be passing a bipartisan transportation bill, as the Senate already did on a 74-22 vote. The Senate has done its job. House Speaker Boehner should drop the notion of passing an extreme Republican-only bill and do as the Senate di did, craft a bipartisan bill that could pass both houses. This is Fresno B. That is in the reddest part of California. Trust me when I tell you, I know that. It's the reddest, most Republican part of California, and they're asking the House to pass the Senate bill. Then we have the Michigan Detroit News. Congress, congressional waffling hurts states' roads. The U.S. Senate has approved a bipartisan plan. While imperfect, it's better than, any, than another reprise of an outmoded Transportation Act that has already been expanded, extended eight times. The disarray hardly gives states the kind of revenue certainty they get from a federal plan, but if Boehner and House members can't agree on their own plan, they'd probably be wise to take what's politically possible and pass it. Pass the Senate bill. Newspapers all over the country, look at this one. Road to compromise. You would think the House would embrace this. What are the American people telling us? We are viewed we in the Congress, as fighting constantly, our, our approval rating is 10%. Madam President, I don't know who that 10% is, but it's probably your family, my family, and the family of my colleague from Missouri. Why is it? Because we can't work together. We proved it today on two bills we can't get together. But we proved a couple of weeks ago after five weeks of debate, we could do it on transportation. When Senator Inhofe and I agree, my goodness, that's a day. We don't agree on so many things, believe me. We're struggling over anything that has the word environment in it. He's fighting to overturn the EPA clean air rules, and I'm fighting him to keep them. 
He doesn't want that much oversight on nuclear accidents. I want more oversight. He says I don't do enough oversight on things he wants oversight on. Listen, we argue. We respect each other. We like each other. We disagree with each other. But on this, we came together. What more does Boehner want? What more does Cantor want? Speaker Boehner is putting at risk 55,000 jobs in Ohio, and Leader Cantor is putting at risk 40,000 jobs in Virginia. Don't they care about the businesses and the workers there? This is the road to compromise. This is the Ohio Akron Beacon from the heartland. On Wednesday, 74 senators, Republicans and Democrats, joined together. They approved a two-year bill. The timing couldn't be better. What will the House do? It should take the cue of the Senate and quickly approve the legislation that won bipartisan support. Couldn't be more clear. That's Ohio. Mr. Madam President, I will tell you, I've never seen such an array of, of newspapers from all over the country. This one's the Chicago Sun-Times. For a better commute, pass the transportation bill. The Senate just delivered a gift to the House, a bipartisan transportation bill at a time when America really could use a lift. Here's hoping the Republicans don't mess it up. Well, hope against hope. So far, I feel very worried, very, very worried. The whole program expires on Friday, and all they can come up with is extensions, and then they don't even have the votes for that. How bad would it be for them to give me a call, give Senator Inhofe a call, and say, you know, we're going to come over and sit down, and bring the bipartisan leadership of the committees, there were four of them, bring the bipartisan leadership of the Senate, and let's hammer something out. What is happening over there? Speaker Boehner is the Speaker of the House, not Speaker of the Republicans. He needs to work with the Democrats. I don't expect they'll love each other, my goodness. We don't expect miracles, but we should expect them to work together. I remember fondly my days in the House. Tip O'Neill and Bob Michael couldn't have better friends. Did they agree on everything? No. Did they work on everything? Yes. I remember because I remember those days. I was a whip at a certain point there in the House, and they used to call us together, and, and we'd come back and say, well, you know, there's 25 Democrats who can't vote for this Democratic bill. And you know what Tip O'Neill would do? He said, fine, I'll call Bob Michael and see if he's got 25 votes for me. And they saw that they might have had 20, and they didn't have 25, and they had to compromise the bill, and they did it. That's why I decided I loved legislating. I loved working on this bill with uh, my friend, Senator Inhofe. I loved working with my staff and his staff. Our staffs became uh, almost like family. And I would encourage Speaker Boehner to take a page out of this book. I see the senator from Louisiana on the floor. He and I go, go at it on a number of issues. We work together. We even put on this bill the Restore Act a bipartisan piece of legislation that is going to make sure that the Gulf can rebuild and gets paid back for the suffering that went on there. Now, did California get a lot out of that? No. But the country will get a lot out of that because the Gulf is a region we care about. It's where we get uh, a lot of our energy. It's where we get a lot of our seafood. We need to work together. So Senator Vitter and I don't agree on a lot of subjects, and we go, we go at it pretty hard in the committee. But on this, we agree. So let's look at a few others, and then I'll yield the floor after we go through the rest of these. Highway bill would boost stability. This is Mississippi. Mr. President, this is one of the reddest states in the union. I beg Speaker Boehner to open his ears and hear me. A two-year, $109 billion highway bill that passed the U.S. Senate this week buoys the hope of road builders and the travel industry that the House can be prodded by the Senator's action to pass its own bill before a March 31st expiration date. This bill has no earmarks. Mississippi could derive major benefits. I, I am just saying, 
when you have editorials from Mississippi for a bill, you know it's a bipartisan bill. Let's take a look at some others, David. A solid transportation bill. This comes from Oregon, the Register Guard, the editorial. By an impressive bipartisan vote of 74 to 22, the Senate on Wednesday passed a two-year blueprint for transportation. The House should move quickly to approve the Senate measure, because if a transportation bill is not approved and signed into law by April 1st, the government will lose its ability to pay for federal transportation projects. So now you have Mississippi, Oregon, Illinois, Ohio. I don't remember all, the, all that I read. Bipartisanship in Senate moves transportation bill. This is Oklahoma, another deeply red state. With rare bipartisanship, the U.S. Senate on Wednesday passed a much-needed and much-delayed national transportation bill that could create jobs and fund road projects. The country's infrastructure has been ignored far too long and is in dire straits. This is an important and necessary expansion of the transportation, extension of the transportation bill, and it will make needed improvements to our infrastructure, and it is a real job creator. Mr. President, I am telling you that these editorials, I am buoyed by them because these editorials from Republican papers, Democratic papers, they're nonpartisan. They're all urging us to act. Transportation funding held hostage in the House. Fort Worth Star-Telegram, Texas, another red state. What an exciting thing to see the Senate pass a surface transportation bill last week on a 74 to 22 vote. Such bipartisan support for maintaining and improving this crucial part of the national infrastructure makes it almost seem like the good old days in Washington. Well, at one point House, Boehner, House Speaker Boehner said he'd put the Senate bill before the House. Earlier he said Republicans might go for an 18-month extension. It's beginning to look like Boehner doesn't have a clue what the House will do. Does this sound familiar? Does it remind you of the congressional follies of last summer, the reality TV drama and brinkmanship of the debate over raising the federal debt? Mr. President, I can't reach Speaker Boehner. He doesn't answer my letters. Cantor doesn't answer my letters. They just have spokespeople who put something out there. What's wrong with talking to each other? What, is, what happened to those days? Now, it goes on, and, and I'm going to go through these. Pass this transit bill. This one is the Miami Herald. In an all-too-rare display of bipartisanship, the Senate, by a vote of 7422, passed a bill of vital interest to South Florida and the rest of the country. And, he, and they say that Boehner's approach is why public approval of Congress stands at 10 percent or below. Mr. Boehner should urge the members of his caucus to set aside their job-killing intransigence and accept the bipartisan Senate version before funding runs out. So here's the thing. I will wrap up. There's a clear path to success here, and it is not painful. It is not painful. Speaker Boehner and Leader Cantor should abandon their idea of these endless extensions. We have proven today through the state organizations and by talking to state, depart state officials in all of our states that jobs are already being lost because of the uncertainty, the dithering, that's my word, and the fact that they're talking about extensions. Extensions are no good. Extensions mean job losses, 41,000 jobs already lost today as of now in North Carolina and thousands in other states because states do not have the ability to upfront the federal share. They are counting on us. Our bill is fully paid for in a bipartisan way. Our bill has not one earmark. Our bill takes 90 programs down to 30. It is streamlined. It is made efficient. We have in a bipartisan way, added the Restore Act. We added ways to fund rural districts for their schools by the timber receipts. Mr. President, this is a really good bill. 
And this is a bill that is truly a product, a work product of everyone in this chamber. Even those who wound up voting no had something to do with it, helped us get it through. So there's a clear path. They pull their 60-day extension off the floor of the House. That's a good thing. And now they should put the Senate bill on the floor, and both sides should embrace it and pass it. And let me tell you a signal it will send to our people at home, a signal of job growth in the future, a signal that we're working together, a signal that we're going to get out of this recession, a signal that we put aside politics for the good of these hard hat workers and the companies that employ them. They deserve it. They got hurt by Wall Street. You know, everybody in the country did, but these construction workers, because of all this messing around with these mortgage-backed securities, it killed the construction industry and housing. We have a chance to help some of the most, the, some of the hardest working people in our nation. And I call on the House leadership to take a page out of our bipartisan book here, pass the Senate bill. I thank you, and I yield the floor. The Senator from Missouri. I uh, thank Mr. President. Um, uh, this week, uh, the majority brought a bill to the floor to uh, 